I started cooking barbecue when I was 35 years old. It's hard to believe. Granddaddy was a cook, father too. Me and him, we was cooking barbecue at the same time. Him up north and me down here. I think he's pretty proud of that. I know I was. Some of the old time cooks never used a thermometer. Some folks find that hard to believe. I always love to hear about the old timers. Never missed a chance to do so. And you can't help but compare yourself against the old timers. Can't help but wonder how they'd operate these times. Price of prime beef you see now, it's hard takes measure. Not that I'm afraid of it. I always knew I had to be willing to try if I wanted to master brisket, but I just don't know if I want to push my chips forward and try and smoke some piece of meat I do not understand. A man would have to put his wallet at hazard. He'd have to say, okay. I'll be part of this world. Hey guys, welcome to my channel. Today we are doing it, finally, a brisket cook on the Old Country Barbecue Pits Pecos with the modified stack extension. That's right, Central Texas style brisket, only salt and pepper, pink butcher paper, and cooking with post oak on an offset. And I'm gonna show you how to make beef tallow, plus we're gonna try to hack to see if we can rest our brisket safely for 12 hours. Let's get to it. All right, so here we have a 13.9 USDA Prime full packer brisket that I got from Costco. I thought about showing a fair amount of the trimming process, but you ought to just watch the video linked in the iCard. Joe Yim does a great job walking through the entire trimming process, and it's one of the better videos out there I've seen about how to trim a brisket. Again, this is Central Texas brisket, so I'm only using coarse ground pepper and kosher salt, and I mix them about a 60-40 ratio, and I'm going about as thick as Aaron does. All right, so here's how you make beef tallow. It's stupid easy. Just put all the fat trimmings in a large pan and set your oven to about 200 degrees and sit back and relax. About six or seven hours later, you're gonna have tallow. Just drain it into a glass jar or pan, let it cool a bit, and then you can put it into a squeeze bottle. Boom. No need to spend 60 bucks on Amazon. One of my viewers recommended putting a water pan below the grate, just offset from the baffle to keep things more even in the cook chamber. So I'm gonna try this just for a period and see if it works. All right, first going on. With the brisket on, I have moved the probes now directly in front of the brisket at the point and behind the flat by the stack, just to monitor temperatures in that area. The water pan, in my opinion, where it's at is impeding the flow of air, so I'm going to take it out and put it here where it belongs. And I can't get it out. So that's a disaster there. I should have used a heavier pan. <laughs> Here we are about three hours in. I'm gonna start spritzing the brisket just with water about every hour from here on out. So far the cooker is running fairly well, ebbs and flows, highs and low temps, but I'm learning it and managing it best I can to stay around 275. So far the temps have consistently been hotter at the stack side by the edge of the flat, which makes sense. It just has me a bit concerned for the flat. About six and a half hours in, the flat was temping around 185, 190. Now a buddy of mine told me not to worry about it and just let it ride, so that's what I did. When it comes to wrapping, I wanted to make sure that the brisket had evaporated enough moisture, the fat had turned yellow, indicating that it was rendered and that there was a good color. Around 0, 0130 with an internal temp about 185 in the point, I decided to wrap. 
it definitely seemed to take a long time to get some color on this thing. And I still wasn't tickled with it, but I wrapped it. Part of me wonders the reason why it didn't get great color on top was because I was using B&B &B Post Oak Splits, which have a moisture content of only about 5%. And it's recommended by Aaron, they should be around 20%. Around 3.45 in the morning, the brisket was finally done. Probe tender in the point and flat. I pulled it off and let it rest on the counter in the kitchen for about 45 minutes to curb any excess carryover and until the temperature began to fall. In Aaron Franklin's book, he writes, resting after cooking is also incredibly important. It allows meat muscles to relax and reabsorb some of the juices that were squeezed out. A good solid rest for a couple of hours may actually improve the meat. And though he doesn't tell you how long he rests his briskets, he does lay it out on page 7. Pulling the briskets around midnight, and they're not serving until 11 a.m. So how's he doing that? Well, it's got to involve a commercial warmer that's able to hold temperature around 150 for 11 plus hours. At this temp, you can safely hold a brisket without overcooking it or drying it out. Now, if you're fortunate, you may have a built-in warmer, but sadly, most residential ovens don't go lower than 170 degrees. However, there is a hack worth trying. It's pretty simple, and the credit here goes to Smoke Trails Barbecue. Just recalibrate your oven to run below its temp. So I'm going to set mine to negative 20, so at 170, it should be 150. We'll see how this works. All right, so here we are just after 5 p.m. That's right, 12 hours later, a 12-hour rest. Now, as you can see, the paper is pretty well soaked. It has that coveted jiggle, but the bark, not great on the fat side, but like a meteorite on the bottom. Weird. Now, I'm no brisket expert, but I could tell that this brisket was a tad too tender. Something seemed off to me. The flat just wouldn't pass the bend pull test. The temps at the point, even with a 40 minute rest out of the oven, was still just shy of 170. Weird, right? That told me something may have gone wrong with the recalibration of the oven. And it didn't help that I was slicing it a bit too thin at first. Plus the fact that I neglected to remember that Aaron recommends letting it cool to 140 to 145 internal. So that may have added to it. The flavor though was great. Moist, not dry at all, good smoke profile, and a nice beefy flavor. So here are my key thoughts after this cook. Number one, beef tallow. I personally think the 11 to 12 hour rest is Aaron Franklin's big secret not beef tallow in a wrap. But you know, the beef tallow is easy to make, and really, what do I know? The long rest and oven hack. Again, I think Aaron's real secret is the long rest, and the oven hack is a great way to get you there. It'll help your brisket retain moisture and stay food safe for many hours and be ready to serve whenever you want to serve it, just like at Franklin Barbecue. That is, if it works. Now, in my case, I failed to run a few tests before I tossed the brisket in there, Afterwards, I found out my oven runs hotter than I expected. With no recalibration, 170 was really 220. Negative 20 degrees of 170, where I ran it for 12 plus hours, was actually around 185, 190, which explains why it was overly tender. Best I could do was negative 35, which gave me readings just under 170. So the hack might work for you, but not for me. I think my best bet is to find a cheap used electric cabinet smoker that can run as low as 145, 150. Stack extension. Now when I made my last video, I wasn't setting out to prove something. I just wanted to apply what Aaron Franklin talked about in his book regarding airflow and the stack effect and see how it worked on the Pecos. I love the added airflow, the clean burning fire, the improved operation. A problem I discovered in this cook though was not the added airflow, but quite possibly how it flows with the added draw from the stack effect. You see, if we look at a crude cross section, we have the exhaust, grate, and baffle. With no extension, the hot gases come in the pit, and as soon as they reach the end of the baffle, they rise straight up and fill the top of the cook chamber, and as they cool, they get pulled towards the exhaust. The airflow here is poor, and the bulk of the hot gases are trapped at the top of the cook chamber. With the 22 inch extension, the draw is so great that the gases are pushed down by the baffle and then shoot straight to the exhaust, 
giving us those higher temps and the back pressure on the stack side. With the shorter stack extension, the 16 inch, the draw is not as hard, so the flow is slower and the gases are able to rise up off the bottom sooner and cross around mid-grate. This is may why at times some folks were reporting higher temps in the center. Now, as I stated in my last video, I knew that adding a brisket or a water pan would likely have some effect on the airflow and or balance of heat side to side. It seems to me that once that packer was on the grate during this cook, a fair amount of that hot gas or air was trapped under the brisket, at least until it rendered at a lot of moisture and shrunk. That's why the bottom was so dark. So what are my options? Well, I could cook my next brisket fat side down or use a boat method since the heat seems to be coming from underneath now. I could also reduce the stack another six inches in hopes that it would allow the hot gas to flow over the brisket rather than under it, plus keep some of the benefits of the added airflow. Now Fick at Fick's Barbecue gave the 10 inch extension a shot and he seemed quite happy with it. Now of course I could just stop messing with this thing altogether and just deal with the poor airflow. And I know a lot of you are gonna tell me to do that or I could reduce or remove the baffle. Sounds crazy, I know, but reducing or removing the baffle with the stack extension should retain that great airflow and allow it to come right up and over the brisket. I might point out Aaron Franklin's pits don't have a baffle. It's probably because of the very things I pointed out here. It hinders the airflow. Now recently, one of my viewers who's quite handy not only added a collector to his Brazos, but he also reduced the baffle and ultimately removed it and found that the vast majority of his grate was even. Now sure, I may lose the right side of the cooking grate when I cut it out, but who cares? I mean, no one really uses it anyways, and that's where the water pan goes. Remember, this is an offset. It's a brisket making machine, and that's what I bought it for. So that's where I'm at. I'm still a firm believer in the airflow and how good it is for a cooker. I'm just not sure how to proceed. So you guys tell me in the comments, any tips for me, please leave them as well. As always, I hope you learned something. I know I certainly did. Thanks for watching.